My name is Jim Beekler, uh, and I'm going to talk about the evolutionary imperative of consciousness. My theoretical consciousness with, is based on magnetism. Magnetism is to electricity what consciousness is to mind. A magnetic vector potential A is a mystery-like thing in physics. It exists and indeed must exist as necessary for electromagnetic theory light and light waves to propagate, but it is never nor can it ever be measured by material means. So the vector A, the magnetic vector potential A, is a mystery in physics. Yet its existence has been verified by the aharonov bohm and similar experiments. The magnetic field B does two things. It guides charged particles and builds semi-permanent multi-leveled structures called domains in three-dimensional objects. Now this sort of sounds like the properties of mind that we normally associate with consciousness. So magnetism is a good thing to use to model consciousness. According to Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, all electrical variations cause magnetic variations and magnetic field variations cause electric field variations. Now this is how the vector potential A arises from the magnetic field B. The magnetic field B is three-dimensional and that's normal we talk about when we talk about magnetic uh, magnetism, the magnetic field. Penrose uh, Roger Penrose claims that the vector potential A is a magnetic quantum fluctuation at the points in space, but most scientists act as if, if not outright believe, it is a necessary mathematical artifact. It has no real existence. Yet the experiments show it's there. We just can't measure it. I contend A is a physically real magnetic field component that extends from each point in three-dimensional space, B, the magnetic field B, along the fourth direction of the embedding space or manifold in a Riemann geometry, the same type of Riemann geometry that Einstein used for his general theory of relativity. So I use it to unify gravity and electromagnetism in a single field theory based on work done by Kaluza, Einstein, Bergman, Flint, and others. Uh, then by solving another geometric anomaly, space-time curvature can be quantized for a complete unification of physics. But that's beyond this particular talk. But this model is related to the overall physics model. So this isn't something I invented just to do consciousness. But that's another story. The unification of physics is not necessary for this model, this physical model of consciousness. Even though unification applies this or similar model of consciousness. This model of consciousness actually leaps out of the physics. And this has consequences. However, five-dimensionality is required, but not quite completely necessary for this. And when I say five-dimensionality, I'm talking about five-dimensional space-time. The final fifth-dimensional space-time would be a fourth, dimensional, a fourth dimension of space itself. Under these physical circumstances, the totality of electric field E, variation, complexity, patterns in the brain, and body correspond to, and are, mind, while the corresponding multi-level magnetic uh, field patterns and vector potential domain A that correspond to these uh, complexity patterns or structures constitute consciousness itself. I'm not saying that the electric and magnetic fields associated with the living body are not mind and consciousness, but I am saying that the multi-leveled stable complexity patterns that constitute the finer structure of the overall fields are mind and consciousness. Now, this alone implies physical consequences of great importance, since the living body, which is a complex matter energy pattern, and brain, uh, which is associated with its own unique complex electric scale or potential pattern, are both three-dimensional, while consciousness, the complex magnetic vector potential pattern, has a strictly four-dimensional existence. Consciousness can survive three-dimensional material death of the body. Material death is three-dimensional alone. After the three-dimensional material death of the body, brain, and mind, the surviving consciousness can reconstitute the mind or the electric scalar pattern of mind independent of the material body, according to Maxwell's Laws of Electromagnetism I read a moment ago. Uh, this constitutes the afterlife physical body, non-material physical body. The extent to which any individual dies the extent to which any individual who dies is aware of this manner, of this new manner of being, depends on the level of that person's uh, consciousness before material 
three-dimensional death occurred. So higher level of consciousness, the more people, a person will be aware of death when it occurs. And the new uh, magnetic vector potential pattern body that the person has. Now there's circumstantial for, evidence for this. In the late summer and early fall of 2014, a woman in Florida and a man in Ohio died. These were warm deaths. But they came back to life after about 45 minutes after brain death. The world's record for warm death and resuscitation is 45 minutes, which was only set recently, this past summer. All these cases are without brain damage. So the, the, the mind is actually being turned on and reconstituted 45 minutes after the person dies? Well, how does that happen? We don't know. It has to be the consciousness survives magnetically, then reconstitutes the mind when the body comes back to life. Now consciousness, which is four-dimensional, survives the three-dimensional death of the body, brain and mind, and then must reconstitute the mind. Now during normal perception pathway during your life, you have 3D space, the external world. Uh, we sense the sort of five senses that comes along the axons to the brain, mind, and finally to the four-dimensional consciousness. But we also have paranormal perception pathway during life. And that's from four-dimensional space to consciousness to mind to 3D brain. That's why paranormal phenomena don't always come to mind. We're not always aware of them, but they're always happening all the time. But we're not aware of them until they have a strong signal in the three-dimensional brain to come into our awareness. Now, after death, this whole perception pattern changes. You have everything in four-dimensional space, which is the rest of the universe interacts with its surviving consciousness and then goes to the 3D mind, which is part of the mind-consciousness complex that survives. The higher or fifth space-like embedding dimension must be single-polar Riemannian as compared to our three-dimensional space, which is double-polar Riemannian, meaning that if you, you have the Earth, if you have the pole, you bring a body all the way around the Earth, the pole is pointing the same direction. But in a single polar Riemannian, it comes around, and when it comes back, like a Mobius strip, it's pointing in the opposite direction. Everything switches right for left if it goes in a higher dimension back to our three-dimensional space. Uh, this means that points in three-dimensional space are extended like a Mobius strip out of and back into the same point from the other side of the three-dimensional space. Uh, I can diagram this. We have two different, this is our three-dimensional space, this is fourth dimension uh, vertically. You have a, an event, some event, and it has a pattern, electromagnetic pattern, and you have your consciousness pattern, say of a living person. And both of these are stretched into the higher dimension and go around like this. But as they go in the higher dimension, they have a certain width, a physical width. But they narrow, narrow, narrow to this single polar point. And as they narrow, they start to overlap each other. And this area of overlap is what we call psi. That is the mechanism of psi. That is the mechanism, the mechanism of the paranormal. And then we just have, that has to register in the consciousness pattern back to the mind and brain of the person to become uh, an ESP event or a psych, uh, PK event. So extrasensory input comes through the higher space connections to consciousness to mind, to brain, and finally to consciousness awareness in the neural nets, brain, if possible. And I call this pattern matching. Due to quantity, in, due to the quantity or the intensity of the signal, or its quality, its quality being if it already matches something in the neural net, a uh, person will become more aware of it. So this model now brings up the question of how memories, thoughts, ideas are recalled and recognized in the brain mind, the whole body, consciousness, the whole body plus the four-dimensional extension are not in the brain. We only become aware of mind and consciousness in the brain, brain because that is the only place in the body where neural nets or logic circuits form. So the key to understanding physical consciousness resides in learning how the neural nets work to store memories, thoughts, recall memories, and recognize external objects through sensory input. Um, this is your, this is a drawing, this is the axon, these are the microtubules. You have an action potential 
it comes up the axon. As it comes up, it electrifies the inside and charges each of the microtubules. And each little microtubule is actually a magnetic, a biomagnetic induction coil. And then this induction coil re reacting, interacting with the capacitance in the axon wall forms an LRC circuit, which is a basic tuning circuit for all radios and televisions. We have millions upon billions of these in the mind. This is a normal electromagnetic. Uh, well, this is the microtubule. These are the tubulin proteins, and the signal goes around alpha, 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 and it's just like a wire around a coil, a cylinder, to form the induction coil. And it's the sequential firing that causes the microtubule to act as uh, basically an electromagnet. So, microtubules in the brain are actually nano-sized biomagnetic induction coils. And when they charge and discharge, an electromagnetic uh, wave pulse is emitted, so they are EM wave pulse transmitters. And we have billions upon billions of these in our brain. So we're just full of little radio transceivers. Nano receivers, transceivers. The electromo these electromagnetic pulses do two things. They resonate with like-sized microtubules in the same and other neurons. But they also set up interference patterns between the individual microtubules in an individual neuron and their neighboring microtubules. These interference patterns force the water molecules between different microtubules in a neuron to create patterns of quantized nuclear magnetic spin resonance. And this imprints the patterns as memories in the very points of 3D space, which are extended into the fourth dimension. So memories are imprinted four-dimensional magnetic vector potential patterns like four-dimensional holograms that correspond to our brain and body. Uh, storing and retrieving memories and thoughts as well as recognition is just a matter of the pattern matching that I just talked about, only on a in the brain level, not in an extended level where ESP occurs. And they're all guided by the microtubules, but carried out by the water molecules in the, in the neurons and in the brain. Now, if incoming sensations or data, and even new thoughts and ideas are intense or strong enough, the resulting stronger resonance patterns between a greater number of microtubules in different neurons establishes patterns of stronger three-dimensional magnetic field lines between nearby neutrons, which increases the possibility of plasticity in the brain. Plasticity is when the dendrites move to different spots with new learning and experience. And we have here a, a microtubule pattern, a dendrite connection to another neuron, and it follows that same microtubule pattern. But with new learning, a new experience, you get a new pattern forming. And so when this new pattern forms, the old dendrite connection follows the stronger magnetic field lines, three-dimensional magnetic field lines, and it moves. So the new pattern here with new dendrite connection reflects new learning and experience. Now microtubules are long and narrow inductors. So the magnetic field outside, above and below and around the cylinder, is zero. But A, the magnetic vector, vector potential is not zero. It's still, ha it's still there. The, when, some, when a cylinder is long and narrow like this, uh, uh, an inductor, the magnetic field lines just come in the two ends, or in one end out the other. Now this is a diagram of this is a diagram of a synaptic bulb or button connected to another, and you can almost see the magnetic field lines coming out. These are um, these are protein filaments, and the protein filaments come out. You've got the transmission here, then you've got other protein filaments here going to the magnetic fields. And so the mag this magnetic field continues right on through to the microtubules in the other neuron, as I've just described. Now, altogether, there are four fundamental magnetic domains or interaction levels that contribute to the awareness of consciousness in the neural nets themselves. 
you've got the first level, which is the axon wall. The charge comes up and down the axon wall, charges the microtubules. The microtube emits a soliton or a pulse, which goes to external or other neurons or to the water molecules to create the interference patterns that uh, create memories and recall and recognition. Then when the microtubules uh, emit uh, solitons or electromagnetic pulses to other, micro <coughs> to other microtubules, that guides the placement of synapses up to the neural net. Everything actually eventually gets to the neural net and then the neural net, that's your fourth level, level domain, so you have first level domain of water molecules, second level domain of microtubules, third level domain the axons themselves, and a fourth level the neural net. And then those neural nets go to a fifth level domain, which is neuron bundles, and then six, seven, eight domains in your brain, which are the various parts of your brain. Eventually, your body has a single magnetic field that exits through the top of your head and then enters through your torso. But it's added up of all these different domains that extend from the water and individual molecules in the body up through all your different organs. Each organ, like the heart, would have its own magnetic field. Then they all add together to give the overall magnetic field. And that magnetic field is not consciousness. It's the domain structure here that is the consciousness. Now the circumstantial verification of this. You've had fMRI studies at Berkeley Lab, uh, the Gallant Lab at Berkeley, where the fMRI, people are shown movies while they're in the fMRI, the fMRI picks up the changing magnetic resonances in their brain and actually replays, reconstructs a movie on the computer. It's really something to see. You can see those at Glant, you can see those at Glant or uh, GlantLab.org. Alzheimer's, the, the memory loss associated with Alzheimer's could be due to deteriorating microtubules. We know that the microtubules unfold in Alzheimer's patients. That could be why they no longer have recall of memories. Memories are still there. They just can't be recalled. Same with, of course, dementia. Now one lab is using my model to design direct mind to machine interfaces. It's a military lab in the United States. I, they don't keep me involved, so I don't know what's going on. I just know they've asked me for information about my model before, but they're trying to use the magnetic fields of the, of the microtubules to directly control, say, airplanes and flights. So the pilot just sits there and flies the airplane without touching inner instruments. It's some really cutting edge stuff and like I say, it's top secret, so I don't really know about it. Neither do you. Now, since the neural nets rewire themselves uh, in something called plasticity or brain plasticity, new learning and experience can scramble existing patterns causing chaos in older patterns that are no longer connected. And this can lead to, this increasing chaos in the brain with new experiences leads to new higher, the emergence of new higher levels of complexity. And an intense enough chaos, system-wide chaos, due to new learning when it scrambles up all the old learning, could even lead to a consciousness-induced leap in evolution. At this point, the ever-increasing complexity of the multi-level magnetic vector potential domain patterns over time implies that a tipping point will or must finally be reached where a new top-down, not bottom-up like Darwin, but top-down evolutionary leap emerges as a result of memory and thought complexity formation instead of normal genetics. Now this is, this is normal evolution. You have chemical reactions, life, mind, consciousness. Consciousness is considered an epiphenomenal thing. It's a secondary effect that just sort of came along with mind and brain. And you have Darwin, natural section, and then modern mutation and genetic drift. This is all bottom up. This is up, that's down. So this is bottom up. Top-down evolution occurs only when newly evolving complexity pattern is strong enough to overcome the material, three-dimensional genetic limitations, and pattern matches, physical reality in the external universe. So you can't have evolution of consciousness unless your consciousness matches the universe. It can't, consciousness cannot evolve with 
wrong ideas. It has to be in tune with the universe to make this complexity leap. And, of course, this consciousness is the part of the body, actually the organ, that keeps us in tune with the rest of the universe through its connections in higher dimension. Now, this further implies that bad learning or wrong knowledge that does not match reality, physical reality, could stump or further block the normal evolutionary path of a, of a species. In other words, everything evolves in conjunction or in parallel with the universe as a whole. And the rules, it, our thoughts, must match the rules or laws by which the universe operates. And that's a source of science. Uh, we have a more, revel, a more realistic evolutionary path then. You have basic chemical reactions, chemical complexities give us life and body. Then you have the functional complexity of electrical patterns, which gives you mind. Then you have the memory complexity, magnetic, that gives you consciousness. But at each level of emergence, the higher level organizes the level below it. And then this, this would be your top-down evolution. At any stage of evolution, chemical complexity, functional complexity, and memory complexity must be in synchronicity with each other before evolution can take place. Although these are different steps in evolution, they must be working together for your overall evolution to take place. So we have something like this. Here's the diagram I just showed you. This is, this is, this is your top-down evolution. This is Darwinian uh, that should be uh, bottom down, or it forms top down evolution, whereas Darwinian evolution comes this way. This is more complicated, but this can explain a lot of things. Uh, 200 million years ago, there was a big, um, a big expansion called the Cambrian explosion when unicelled, uh, unicelled organisms that made up all the life on the earth sort of dis started disappearing, and all of a sudden, over a period of a million years or so, we have bicameralism, uh, right-left symmetry in the body, plus brains and multi-celled organisms evolving. Very complex life forms, just from one cell living organisms. They can't explain that. That's because when a new complexity emerges, you can get a bifurcation or a splitting. About the same time, shortly thereafter, there was a split, and a split into animal life, where brain and central nervous system came about. And I'm saying that, that this bifurcation occurred when mind took over. That's why you have bicameralism, because mind is electrical. Bicameralism, right, left brain, and so on and so forth, are positive, negative electricity. It's dual. And at this bifurcation, then you also had plant life based on photosynthesis, but plant life has no brain or central nervous system. And that's because it's a complexity of form. So you have the form of plants and such, rather than animal life, which was a functional complexity of the mind, where the mind dominated consciousness and this. So you can explain a lot of the leaps in evolution that can't otherwise be explained using this model. Now, human-level consciousness is characterized by self-awareness. Now, this requires at least mental concepts of localization as opposed to localization. Um, in other words, we only became self-aware after we learned that the world constitutes its uh, world continues far beyond our vision and our experience of the world. I'm here, but I know there's somebody down in Australia. I know that that's non-local, but I know local. I separate myself from from someone in Australia or on the moon or someplace else. At some point, we went from a holistic worldview to actually start separating ourselves from the rest of the world first in space, and then in time, and that's when history was born. But not only history, we look to the future, and that's when we start thinking about an afterlife. What happens after we die, because something continues, or we sensed, we intuitively knew that something continued. So, this progression of evolution makes, uh, mimics Jean Piaget's theory of childhood learning, which implies a child inherits a brain structure already prepared to accept consciousness at higher levels and increase the level of consciousness, but must first fill that structure in the same order that original evolution of that structure took place. First spatial awareness, then temporal awareness, and then self-awareness. 
Science will have caught up with our intuitional, intuitional knowledge of reality and fully exploited the concepts of space-time and non-locality locality for the first time in human history during the early 20th century for the second scientific revolution. It's only in this past century that science has caught up with what we knew intuitively about space and time. Um, science brought the concepts of space-time to a new level of human understanding that now requires and has even opened human consciousness up to greater or the possibility of something greater, a greater consciousness. In other words, science only caught up with our evolved or evolving consciousness within the past century and has put us on track to going beyond our own consciousness. Science is going beyond our own consciousness, which is enhancing the possibility of a new leap, evolutionary leap for us. We are rapidly approaching a new leap in human evolution that will take us literally, literally mentally and spiritually beyond our present four-dimensional space-time limitations. Since the paranormal and survival required by five-dimensional geometry that constitutes that consciousness utilizes, the paranormal will become even norm more normal at this higher level as we learn to operate in five-dimensional space the same way we do in four-dimensional space-time. So, the evolutionary imperative is survival itself, but not just survival of species like in Darwinian, but survival of the individual past death.